Welcome to the farm. It's an exciting day here at St. Isidore's Meat. I have holistic veterinarian Dr. Sarah coming out to check on the herd and make sure everything's going okay. And then I've been invited to a church lady picnic. Now I've got to take a hot dish down, so for the ingredients, I'm taken off to Eau Claire to the community garden to pick up some vegetables. And then it's off to my friend Eli's to get some lard for the pie crust. Gather with us around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. A few years ago, I moved up to Wisconsin. I started an organic dairy farm at St. Isidore's Mead. That's when I discovered the abundance of Midwestern local food and small-scale farmers, growing everything from green zebra tomatoes to pasture pork. I'm taking a break from the cows, hitting the road, and seeing if I can't satisfy my epicurious appetite. Oh. That's great. This is amazing. Funding for Around the Farm Table is provided in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, a member-driven organization for family farmers, rural communities, and all people. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. Information at wisconsinfarmersunion.com. With additional support from these community members, and friends of Wisconsin Public Television. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. How are you doing? Hey, Kana. How are you? Come on in. So I asked Dr. Sarah to come out today. I just wanted to do an overall check of the herd health, make sure everything's going okay. I think that's something important to do, especially in sustainable agriculture. I wanna make sure that I'm preventing any issues of happening. But Dr. Sarah, one issue I've been having with this cow is a high cell count. I can't figure it out. I've been trying to boost that immune system, do some other things, but she still has a high cell count. Now, when we look at mastitis, we divide them into two categories. We want to know the contagious and the environmental. They act very differently in the cows. The contagious, usually the cow eats, she doesn't have a temperature, she's flaking once in a while, but she doesn't have a swollen quarter. Mm -hmm. And that that can lead, sometimes that will go away, that many times has to be treated, and that can lead to a prolonged somatic cell count that you're talking about. Then we can go into the environmental, the hot mastitis. And it's important to, if this issue continues to have a culture done and to determine what bacteria, because we don't want to be spreading it to other cows. Okay, so one thing that I do with these cows here is when I when I feel like they've got, a, or when I test for that high cell count or when I see anybody sloughing off anything, I go right to the aloe vera. Uh, and I try to get them that aloe vera to boost their immune system. I've been using the CEG, the cayenne, echinacea, and garlic uh, to, to hit that infection with, because that's the echinacea and, or the garlic and cayenne, is, they're both like sort of the natural antibiotics. Yes, people, many people don't know that garlic and a lot of those other herbs, they have a lot of bacteria, antibacterial properties. And garlic is, has 35 sulfur compounds that are very close to the antibiotic. Wow. We can apply essential oil-based products that are known for killing certain bacteria and, and studies have have proven that so we can do that topically um, I like to make sure and feel that there's not any sores any abscesses there will be a reason why that it's reoccurring I would maybe apply some topical products that are maybe good for um, bacterial issues so like a like a tea tree oil or like a peppermint or peppermint uh, what's good about peppermint and and some of those is that it causes vasodilation and that will in help flush out the bad cells and and get the immune cells in. And I've done some studies on essential oils and actually look at them in the lab and see which bacteria specifically to mastitis they kill and essential oils do a great job at killing a lot of the mastitis. So in that case, I know there's some essential oils that work as well for fly control. Is What have you found that's effective for you in your own herd or on the herds that you treat? Yes, the studies that I have done, um, there's blends, different blends of essential oils and I have um, a, a good one here that I like that it has a lot of different blends in it. It has lemongrass, eucalyptus, um, uh, tea tree, a little ginger. Um, I'll try it out here. Yes. And it what's smells delicious. Yes, and it's a great alternative to the chemical-based insecticides. I have a lot of conventional farms that use it as well. You can do it twice a day, you can do once a day, depending on the, how much oil is in there. Um, it's important to use a blend, though, and to have it properly diluted. I feel like rotational grazing can maybe help with flight Yes, control, it's a system or? approach. A, yeah, yes. yeah. 
Well, Dr. Sarah and Kane and I are going to take a look at the rest of the herd, find out what I'm doing good and what I need to improve on, and then I'm going to get changed, head up to the church, talk to Pastor Terry about what I should be expecting from a church lady picnic, and then it's off to gather the ingredients. Well, since I was coming up to the church anyway, I thought I'd look in on my friend Clarence. You know, thinking about community today and all the different things, uh, Clarence was the first person in the community to really embrace me and welcome me in. We would have lunch together. He would drive me up and down these roads and tell me about all the farmers and the history of this place. Uh, he taught me that it was okay to wear bib overalls as much as I wanted to, and he was one of my dearest friends. So Clarence, I hope you're resting in peace. <laughs> Well, hello, Pastor Terry. Hello, Inga. It's nice, nice to see you. you. How are you doing today? Very good. The features in here are just beautiful. You know, the unique nature of this church really begins with the setting here. It's such a beautiful spot on top of the hill and just a panoramic view in any direction that you look. But inside, there are some unique features, too. And, and one of them, I guess, that's probably near the top of the list or at the top of the list has to be the altar. It's a very unique piece that was carved in a particular style that's not widely known in the United States. There are some examples incorporated into other pieces, such as cabinets or, or uh, jewelry boxes, those kind of things. But to have an altar in a Christian church that incorporates Christian symbolism and also draws from the, what's known as the Dracosteel or dragon style carving, which pulls in some pagan symbolism is really kind of unique. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Who built this? The altar was carved by uh, two brothers. Espidal was their last name. And I believe there was some connection between their family and the pastor who served here at the time, Pastor Folkestead. He was able to convince them to come to the United States and spend the better part of a year working on this piece. We're very blessed to have their, a bit of their handiwork here. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Terry. And thank you for sh sharing the story of this beautiful church and the community that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. Why don't we take off to a different community, the community garden in Eau Claire, to learn about what community garden is and what vegetables are growing. Andrew, how, how are, are you? you? Good, how are Thanks you doing today? Thanks for bringing this. Yeah, I thought you guys, I had a lot of extra compost and I thought you guys could use some. Looks so. good, yeah, we definitely can use whatever you have. Good. So, so how are things going at the community garden this it's year? It's been a great season. Uh, we've had, you know, rain every few days and we've had a great volunteer crew down here too, so it's been a, yeah, really great season. That's great. So tell me just a little bit about the concept of a community garden. We started this garden six years ago and the whole idea is that we wanted people that are in an urban environment living in the city be able to get their hands dirty and grow their own food and so um, you know we started small but we've grown to over a hundred members that are wow. part of the garden and uh, as you can see we're down here on the river in downtown Eau Claire so mm -hmm. we're as downtown as it can get and we're growing food uh, locally. Well Andrew I'm headed off to a community celebration it's a church lady picnic and we're all supposed to bring uh, something for the supper so but I haven't been as great in my garden as I should be so sure. I don't have a lot of vegetables and I'm wondering if I can pick some up here. Absolutely. We have a lot on right now and especially with uh, it being the middle of summer it's it's uh, bountiful so whatever you want to pick. Okay yeah. well let's get this unloaded and we'll head over. It's fun to see how artistic everybody is and creative and making their space really reflect their personalities. I, I do think that um, People really take ownership and they feel like, you know, like a lot of these plots that we're looking at right here have been a garden for the last six years. So people are building their soil, oh. they're, you know, putting love into the into the ground, they're really taking care of their spots. It looks like you guys are growing quite a bit of food here. Do you have any extra vegetables at the end of the day? The idea is you come down and you work a few hours and then we harvest together and we share the produce. Whatever's left over, um, we actually bring to the community table and last year that was between three to four thousand pounds of food wow. that we harvested. But yeah, it's been a partnership that we've had for six years now. 
These community gardens are really inspiring because not only are you getting people from the community together to, to grow food or have those potlucks, but you're also bringing the, uh, all the community in with right. having healthy food. And we also offer an opportunity for groups that want to do volunteer service. Um, if there's a church group that wants to bring their congregation down here, we have kids groups come through every year. Um, the YMCA will bring kids. And um, we've had thousands and thousands of people in Eau Claire visit the garden. Well, good for you for taking on a project like this. Thank you. It's, I, I'm gonna be more like you when I grow up. <laughs> it's a team effort for sure. <laughs> well, I need to get some zucchini for sure and okay. then uh, see what other kind of vegetables you have. So. Okay, wonderful. I'm at my friend Eli Gingrich's in Augusta, Wisconsin. I need some lard for this recipe I'm making today. I'm planning on doing a vegetable pie with a lard crust, and this is the place to go for good pork. He does a fantastic job with grazing all of his animals, and this is a great look at a diversified farm. So let's go find out where he's at. Hi there, Eli, how are you doing Hi. today? Good to see you. Same to you. Hey, that's not one of my old shorthorn, is it? Oh, well, yes, it is. They grow that's up. That's so Blossom. Nice. Oh, what a great name. I love that. So, uh, <laughs> yes, that's the heifer we bought at your auction, what, four or five years yeah, ago? Yeah, yeah, that's so great. She's at her fourth calf now. Doing well. She looks good. Uh, yeah, she I almost, is. I'm almost uh, sad that I switched over to jerseys, but the well, jerseys give so much milk, so. <laughs> they give a lot of cream, yeah. no doubt about it. Eli, these pastures look amazing. Yes, they turned out very well this year with all the moisture we've had, and uh, it's a new pasture. We like to renovate our pastures every five years, once every five years if we could, reseed it back down. And this is a pretty diversified farm. How many different things are you producing here? Well, we have uh, corn, um, hay, we have small grains, plus, uh, plus our pastures. So we have lamb, pork, and beef. So our goal is to, is to try to raise as many pounds of meat per acre as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, can we go see some of the pigs? Sure. I've never seen pigs on this great a pasture before. It's amazing to see them like this. Yeah, they're having fun, as you can see. <laughs> they enjoy it out there. So what is all in this pasture? Well, there's a mixture of some clover, but mostly there's some grazing corn, there's some oats, there's some kale and radish. It's all what they call summer annuals, and it's high in energy, uh, high in protein, and the uh, pigs do very well on it, along with grain we feed up at the, uh, the house. And uh, of course, as you saw, the dairy cows, whatever waste milk we have from, from a cheese process or butter, anything that's left over goes to the pigs. This must be amazing. The flavor of the meat must be incredible. It is. It is incredible. Once you once you eat the, this type of meat, you don't want to go back. There definitely is a difference. There definitely is. Well, I think that a lot of the flavor of of meat comes through when the animals are raised cor happily, too, and correctly. Well, you've got that, and you've got the diversity of the different foods and also the exercise the pigs get. Uh, they don't grow as fast than they would in confinement. But in confinement, they're mostly raised on uh, corn and soybeans. Mm -hmm. You've only got that one flavor mixed in where here they're uh, rooting in the soil. They're getting all the diversified different plants. And so it makes for a different texture of meat and also a healthier meat, mm -hmm. plus, plus a more enjoyable meal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Eli, you've really opened my eyes a lot to how important diversity is on a farm. I'm going to head down to Augusta Meats because I can get some of, I need lard. I'm going to okay. use a recipe with lard. So I, I, can I just run down there and? Oh, uh, sure. Okay. Ralph would be more than happy to help you. All right. Well, thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for stopping. Have a great day. You too. So when I was thinking about things that I wanted to take to the church lady picnic, I wanted to take something a little bit unique. And I thought the, the zucchini pickles would be 
perfect. They're delicious. They're delicious right out of the jar, or you can also put them on hamburgers or uh, anything really. They're just really great. I'm just gonna mandolin two zucchinis. I like to use the two different colors. Just It looks prettier in the, in the jar. Now, I've got all my zucchini here, and I'm gonna add a little bit of salt onto the zucchini and let it sit for a few minutes. Bring some of that moisture in the zucchini out. This is gonna to help to make sure that the pickles are nice and crisp. To the zucchinis, we're gonna add an onion, and I'm not gonna mandolin the onion, I'm just gonna slice it, but you wanna slice it as thin as you can go. Then just toss your onions right on top of the zucchini and set that aside, and then we'll start with the brine. So the brine for this refrigerator pickle is gonna be some apple cider vinegar, sugar, some turmeric, and dry mustard. Cook that over medium heat until everything dissolves. Give it a good stir. It's gonna take about a minute, maybe two. Once your mixture has dissolved, then you can start adding your zucchini into your jar here, and the onions. I'm packing them in nice and pretty. Sometimes what I'll do too is if I have a hot pepper out in the garden, I'll slice that up and add a little bit of extra heat to this. We'll put a couple of these on the top. And then it's as simple as just pouring that brine right into your mason jar. And remember, these are refrigerator pickles, so they're only gonna last in your fridge for a couple days, so don't try canning these. Probably won't work. Delicious. Oh, it smells really good, too. That apple cider vinegar is such a nice flavor. Alrighty. It's as simple as that. So I'm gonna set these to the side and then I'm gonna turn the rest of these great vegetables I got from the community garden and the lard from Eli's into a vegetable savory pie. So I thought since we're going to a church lady picnic, it's a special event I was gonna make the pie crust like my grandmother used to make with a home rendered lard. Lard is really easy to render. The first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is take all that pig fat, place it in a heavy bottom pan with about an inch of water in the bottom. That's gonna make sure that the fat doesn't burn too quickly. Set that over medium low heat so the fat cooks down slowly. This is gonna help the flavor be really clear, delicious, and the color is gonna be extremely white this way. Once the lard's completely rendered, strain it again, and then pour that into some mason jars and chill it in the fridge. So I've got a, some flour right here, and I learned, I used to always be the kind of woman that made pie crust in a uh, Cuisinart. I thought it was so easy, and it really is, and sometimes I still do that. But after a trip to France, I got to experience how the French women make their dough, and they do it all by hand. It's very different than the way we do it here. So I've got just all-purpose flour. I'm gonna put in about, oh, and the woman I was with in France didn't measure anything either, which I thought was great. About, uh, yeah, that's probably, well, a half one just for good health. And then a sprinkling of salt here. And we're gonna work the, the lard and the flour in together. So you're just gonna keep working the flour into the lard with your fingers. And if you need to, depending on the day and the temper of the day, add a few little drops of cold water to help everything come together. Okay, and then just work that dough into a ball like so. I'll put this, I'll wrap this up and I'm gonna just let it chill in the fridge for a few minutes, get my hands clean and start on the pie filling. So the first thing we're gonna do is make a nice white sauce for this whole thing. Start with some butter right into a pan. Now that the butter's melted down, I'm gonna add a little bit of flour, and you wanna cook the flour just until that flour taste comes out of it. The flour is really just a thickener for the sauce. Stir that in, here we go. Now I'm just gonna slowly add the milk to this. And just stir that up so it doesn't get lumpy. Okay, back on the heat we go, and then I'm gonna add the rest of the milk slowly again, just incorporating it all in so that it's, you know, it doesn't get clumpy. Nobody likes a clumpy white sauce. Okay, so it looks like this has come almost to a boil, so I'll turn the heat off, and then I'm gonna incorporate some of our St. Isidore's cheese in here, and just stir that in nicely to melt it down. Ooh, it smells really good, that uh, 
The cheese is, it's fun. We've, I've been eating it when it's six months old and now it's uh, over a year old and it just, it changes with every month. It's just delicious and the smell is quite wonderful. I want to add my vegetables right to the white sauce here. I've got some vegetables that I've already parboiled because they take a little bit longer to cook. So that's like my potatoes and my carrots. So I'm just going to put these right in here. That's probably enough for this pie. And then those vegetables that don't take as long to cook, like your zucchini or your onions or your radishes, can go in raw right into the sauce here. So let's just, I'm gonna cut up about a half of the zucchini, and I just wanna cut these all into bite-sized pieces. All your vegetables really wanna be the same size. It just makes for a better eating experience. And your onions here. I try like crazy to cut onions in the correct way and I still have not gotten the concept yet. One day I hope to. In we go here. Okay, and then a few radishes. The radishes are gonna offer a nice variety of flavor and a different texture and a little bit of a surprise in a vegetable pie. Feel free to use whatever vegetables that you have, you know, make it. You can do it seasonally. You could put parsnips and squash in here later on in the fall, which I think would be lovely. Okay, that seems like it's enough radishes. Let's just incorporate all that in together in the white sauce. Put a little salt and pepper in here. Oh, you know, I think I'm gonna add some parsley to this too. Brighten up the flavor a little bit. Just give your parsley a good chopping up. It smells good. It's gonna taste good. Add that right into here. Give it a good stir. And now I'm just gonna grab one of my pie plates, uh, my pie bird, of course, and the crust. Okay. I really like using pie birds. I think they just make everything look at that sweet little vintagey feel, and they, they work well. I mean, they have a purpose, obviously. So put your pie bird right in the middle and put your vegetables around evenly. Ooh, this is like so creamy. It looks pretty. There you go, little guy. He's like swimming in a little vegetable goodness there. Let's set him over here and roll out your pie crust. And then you'll just put the pie crust all the way, oh, it's flimsy. Put the pie crust just all the way over your little crow so he can sing out all the steam. It's gonna look better after it bakes, I promise. And then just make your sides look nice and pretty. Okay, now this pie is ready for the oven and I'm ready to get into my outfit that I have picked out especially for the church lady picnic. I'll meet you guys down in Blue Mounds. <laughs> How are you doing today? Good, good. good. Welcome to the Church Lady Picnic. Yeah, thanks but you for have, inviting me. Yes, you have to wear Do you mind? Yes, no, not at all. <laughs> so how did this picnic get started? Oh, it was kind of a crazy notion. We had had a, a couple, unfortunately, some funerals in the family, and we're eating all this really good food. And I said, well, that's really too bad that somebody has to die for... <laughs> for really good food. <laughs> for really good food. And so I thought, well, let's try to create a similar party. And I thought, well... A fake church picnic was a little classier than a fake funeral. <laughs> and Susan and Matt suggested their farm, and that here we are. Weird. I love it. I feel like these are my kindred spirits. I see a lot of vintage aprons and hats, and it's like, I'm home. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. And the aprons just, we told people it was a, a church-inspired picnic. They just showed up in the aprons and in the hats. We, we never asked people to dress this way. And <laughs> as you'll see, there's quite a variety of them. Well, good. Well, I'm going to go set my food down. Can I just uh, find a table down here? Yeah, or? please do. We've got them marked for appetizers, desserts, okay. whatever you need. I get some so. pie and pickles. So. All right, great. great. I'll down there. What could be better than a church lady picnic in the heart of the Midwest? I love pie birds and vintage tablecloths. Mac and cheese, a Wisconsin classic. Lime jello, 
topped with pineapple and maraschino cherries. Tomato mushroom relish, yum yum. Green bean casserole, a Wisconsin classic. Serve the veggie pot pie hot or cold. Zucchini quick pickles, crisp and tangy. Food, friends, and fun. A winning combination. I hope this has inspired you to get your community together and have a church lady picnic. And I hope you gather with us next time. Funding for Around the Farm Table is provided in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, a member-driven organization for family farmers, rural communities, and all people. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. Information at wisconsinfarmersunion.com. With additional support from these community members and friends of Wisconsin Public Television.